five things that God does not know. Do you know what they are? All right, let's say it together. He does not know a sin he does not hate. He does not know a sinner he does not love. He does not know a heart that he cannot change. He does not know a sin he cannot forgive. And he does not know a better time than now. There in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in our scripture reading, it says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Faith is extraordinary. Scripture says that God gives all of us a measure of faith. Our faith is in Jesus Christ when it comes to our eternal security, our eternal destination, when it comes to our eternal life. Not only in the, that hope of the second coming of Jesus and the resurrection of the dead in Christ, but the hope and the promise of God that by his power he will transform us into his likeness. I recall many years ago when I was a young Christian, just come into the church, and I um, read a text that really, it, it, it brought a lot of, I should say, turmoil in my own life. It was, to me, a very fearful thing to read. It didn't bring comfort to me. It frightened me. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, I know now that that doesn't bring any fear to me at all because I understand it now more so than I did so many years ago. The perfection that Jesus is talking about is the perfection in Jesus Christ himself. God created everything perfect. He created a man and a woman, and they were perfect. Everything that he created was perfect until sin came and marred everything. It is as though a tornado came through his creation, and it whipped through the hearts of a man and a woman and completely transform them, change them, so that their natures were changed now. And they were not perfect, and they were not good anymore. It was only by the promise of God that he would correct this, that he would make everything right again. And the perfection comes in the life of everyone who believes in Jesus Christ by God's own power. That's why Paul says this, to rest in his power. It's his power that transforms us, that makes us into new, a new creation. Jesus said that if he would be lifted up, he would draw all to himself. It is the tremendous love of God on the cross of Calvary that we begin to see the love of God. And I tell you this, that the plan of salvation is more complicated than God presents it in Scripture. I believe that. And I believe what happened at the cross only God himself can know. 
But at least we, as we delve into what happened at the cross, we can see the tremendous love of God for lost human beings. And the entire universe has been drawn to him. It, his love is like a magnet. It pulls the whole universe, his whole family together. They see God in a different way than they've ever seen him before. The only way to perfection is through Jesus Christ, the one who can justify us. We are justified by our faith in him. Do you believe that Jesus was real? Do you that believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be, that he is the I am, that he is the one that God sent his only son to this world? Do you believe that? I believe it as though he had actually did happen. It was a reality, as though it happened yesterday. Jesus was real. He wasn't, as the Gnostics say, some kind of a ghost figure or something. He wasn't a figment of people's imagination. He was real. We have historical records that do testify of that. We have God's word. Is God a liar? God says, I do not lie. And anyone who serves me and loves me Will not, will not be a liar either. God is real. Jesus Christ is real. And his death was real. It really happened because he loves you with a love that you cannot begin to comprehend. And when he says, be ye also perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect, that means in Christ Jesus. And what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? It means by beholding him as the scripture portrays him, the real Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the living God, that through him there is eternal life. Through him there is immortality. Through him is peace and love. Through him is a continual relationship with the God of all creation. It's amazing, isn't it? Think of that. Marvel at that. Jesus justifies us. And when we say, he says, be ye also perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect, that is something that people should not be afraid of. You know, many Christians say, oh my, like I did, right? I became a legalist. Well, I don't know, Lord. Be as perfect as you are. But I'll do my best. I'll do my best. I'll really watch my behavior especially around my brothers and sisters in church. Hmm. I'll really try my best. I'll try to keep sin in check. But you know, it was years later I found out that doesn't work. But when I realized what God is saying, Norman, just rest in Jesus. His perfection. His perfection, his righteousness covers you. When I look at the cross, I see. You know, the, the Romans, when they crucified someone, we always see pictures of Jesus hanging on the cross and the two thieves, right? They're always clothed. The Romans stripped every one of them of every stitch of clothing. They hung on the cross naked. But I tell you this, when I behold my Jesus on the cross... I see the most beautiful garment in existence because I see his garment of righteousness, of purity, of holiness, and that is something that I want for myself. And God promises all of us that. Be ye also perfect. We are stand before God, justified through the faith that we have in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us on the cross. And we are looked at as though we are perfect even by our heavenly father because he sees the righteousness of Jesus that we are wearing, not only in, outside but inside. 
We internalize it. It is though that, you see, it does no good to cover us up. Something has to happen, right? We have to be changed. Jesus said that, you know, he made that point very clear, especially to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Paul makes it very clear, right? If any man or woman is in Christ Jesus, they are a new creation, right? A new creation. Behold, the old is passed away. Behold, all things have become new. See, many Christians believe that just as long as you believe in Jesus, that's all it's going to take. But no, you've got to allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life and change your very nature. And I'll tell you this, that is not easy, to die to self. Deny yourself, Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. Dying to self is painful. It is not easy. But it is possible because Jesus has made it poss possible. Justification is the crediting of Christ's righteousness to deplorable sinners. We can't help ourselves. We just sin naturally. That's our nature. But God justifies us in Jesus Christ. Justification by faith and trust. You can't just say, well, I have faith. But what do you have faith in? It is Jesus Christ and him crucified, right? You have to have, you see, faith has to have an object. What is that object? It's Jesus Christ and our trust in him that what he says he will do for us, he will do it, right? He says that we will become perfect. I believe that total perfection will come when Jesus comes and gives us a new body. That's total perfection. Redemption begins when we give our life to Jesus. It's a process. We call it sanctification, right? Growing in Christ Jesus, becoming more like him in character day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, growing into Jesus Christ. That's being mature. God wants us to grow up in Christ. He wants us to develop this beautiful character that he has prepared for us. We will become like him in character. So we are to be like him. God made this plan of salvation so simple. I said it's very complex, and I believe it is, because we're going to be studying what happened here on this earth when Jesus came for all eternity and never understand it fully. But God is so great, isn't he? He took something so complicated so that we can understand it that even a child can understand it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn sinners, but he sent his son that the world might be saved through him, right? God doesn't condemn anybody. He loves us all. He loves the sinner. Even some people that we don't see that's too lovely, right? It can be, Jesus, this is the hard thing too, isn't it? Love your enemies, as Jesus said. Love your enemies. My, what a demonstration. You see, God just doesn't, he just doesn't tell us to do something that he himself cannot do. What did Jesus do at the cross? Father, forgive them. Who were they? They were his enemies, right? Look what they were doing to him. They made fun of him. They mocked him. And they crucified him. Jesus, who is the creator of all things, could have destroyed them, wiped them out of existence in a flash. Correct? But what did he do? 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I wonder how many of those people there who heard that will be in the kingdom. I like to think that there's at least some, don't you? I like to, I like to think that there's some that the Holy Spirit was able to bring over. You know, I, 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 really, I really do believe that. God is so merciful, so loving, and he loved you. He loved me while we were his, still his enemies, right? Still in rebellion, open rebellion against him. He loves us. I haven't come to condemn you, but I come to save you. I come to make you perfect. I come to restore my image in you. I come to develop in you a character like that of Jesus. That's the whole point. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans, the fifth chapter, and verse 1. Now, this is a subject that we as Adventists really need to be focusing more than we are, and that is Jesus Christ. It really brings me to tears sometimes when I think of all of the, the, the well, I just say, you know, all of the sins in, in the church, you know, things that people are doing as Christians and even as pastors and uh, the tragedies that take place because of sin because of not looking to Jesus and having a connection with him. You see, it is very important that we keep that connection. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. Being at peace with him. Not at war with him anymore, but peace. Peace. This is the gospel, is it not? This is the good news. God loves us, and he wants to bring about reconciliation between himself and a lost planet, lost human beings. What a love that God has for us. It is so tremendous. By beholding Jesus at Calvary, sin really, I should say, sin is really really magnified on the cross because we see what sin actually does. It brings about that separation. But Jesus brings about reconciliation. I love you. And he says, I am coming again. You are justified. You are justified. I give you my robe of righteousness, my perfection. I give to you. I will give you a new nature. I will change you. You will one day stand before the courts of heaven. You will stand on the great sea of glass, right? You will stand before the Father and the Son. You indeed will praise them. God is so beautiful, is he not? God can't wait to get us home. Listen, when Jesus made that statement, be ye also perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect, he also says this, you know, we can say, there is no way that I can do this. People, I tell you, I have ministered, you know, to so many people in my life who say, well, pastor, when I overcome this, and when I give this up, and when I give that up, then I'll come to Jesus. All right. They'll never come. I have to make that point. You will never come. Jesus says this to every human being. I will convict you of sin. Right? I will bring the guilt that you are a sinner. But I will also at the same time not leave you there in that position, but I will also convict you of righteousness, right? Right doing. And you will have a desire in your heart to do what is right because I will put that desire in your heart. And only when you act upon that desire, come to me as you are. Jesus says, it doesn't make any difference how many sins you have committed or what you may have done. 
no matter how horrible of a human being that you have been, if there is still a flicker of hope in your heart, I will appeal to it and I will draw you to me. I will convict you of sin and of righteousness. And Jesus says that it doesn't make any difference. I will accept anyone who comes to me. He that cometh to me, to me I will in no wise, what? Cast out. No one. That means every one of us. God loves us so much, so very, very much. We are justified by our faith. But as you know, a lot of Christians make a big thing out of faith, 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 faith. Whereas if you're not weak in faith, then I'm sorry. God can't work the things that he wants to do for you. But, you know, I believe this about my heavenly father. He accepts whatever faith I have in him. No matter how small it might be, he accepts it. He loves it. And people who have little faith, listen to this, God will work extraordinary things. He'll do extraordinary things in their life, even miracles that he will not perform for some of you because he wants to strengthen their faith, right? Right? You don't have to have your strength, your faith strengthened, do you? Well, I think we probably all could say, yes, we do, right? We all need to grow in faith. But the faith doesn't save us. It's the object of that faith. It is Jesus Christ. Jesus wants to put his robe of righteousness, of perfection. He wants to justify us. He wants to sanctify us. He wants to save us to the very, very end of time. We are saved in Christ Jesus. I want you to look at Luke. And I can say that, and I believe that. Some people say, well, you can't really be sure, Pastor, about your salvation, you know, because, you know, that's, that's going too far. No, it isn't going too far because my Bible says this, Norman, you can know that you have eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Lord. You have eternal life through him. That you might know that you have eternal life. Not that you think, or maybe you might have, Know that you have it as long, Norman, as you keep in connection with Jesus Christ. That's the key, is remaining connected to him through the study of his word and through prayer. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out the 70. The 70 people to go and witness for him. And they go out and they come back and they are just, oh, they are ecstatic, right? They are just filled with so much joy. This is what they said, verse 17 and the 70. Returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. What? Can you imagine yourself among the 70 coming back and you're all excited about this and Jesus makes that kind of a statement? What's that got to do with what we were doing? I think Jesus saw the same spirit displayed there among his disciples there, among that 70, the group of 70 that went out and came back that he saw in Satan. The war in heaven. Satan, who took all of the glory unto himself. We have done this, Lord. I saw Satan as fall as lightning from heaven. We have to be careful, don't we? Any good thing that we do in the name of Jesus, he gets all the credit, right? Jesus, you did this. I had nothing to do with it, but you did. Matthew chapter 7. You know the story. Many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, have we not done, you know, I mean, many wonderful works in your name. I mean, we cast out devils. We've done all of these things, miracles, and everything in your name. And he says, I have to say to them that, sorry, but I really didn't even know you. You spent all the time taking all the glory to yourself, even as I was working, you know, through you and among you, you didn't give me any credit. 
and I left. You continued on. All of the good things that you were doing were all your stuff, not mine. I did not know you. These people did not stay in connection with Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 22, we have the, a parable that Jesus gave to us. And it's about the, the wedding. <clears throat> Matthew 22, beginning with verse 1. I'm not going to read the whole story here, the whole parable. Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Well, you know, we've got too much to do. I, am a, I have a business to run, and I'm not interested. And some of them made fun of the messengers who came to invite them to the king's uh, son's wedding, and they ended up even killing some of them. Who is this? It's Israel, isn't it? It's Israel he's talking about. Well, in the end here, I mean, you know, what does he do? But he sends them out again. I want you to go all over the world. I want you to go on the highways. And I want you to give the invitation to this great marriage feast that I'm going to have for my son. Give it to them. It doesn't make any difference to the good, the bad, whoever will come, let them come. That's what Jesus did, did he not? Israel rejected him, and then he brings in the Christian church, right? All who will come, come to me. Now the problem is, in the parable here, in the end, that there is a a man who comes to the wedding feast and the king sees him, I mean immediately, because he doesn't have the wedding garment on. And so in the end, he has him taken out, bind him and take him out. And an end came to his life. This is the problem of many Christians this is the problem of many Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And that is, they don't want to put on the robe of Jesus' righteousness. We have to put it on. Not because I have to, but because I want to. People who don't want it aren't going to get it, right? It's those of us who want it who see that our need, we really need his robe of righteousness around us. And the only way that we're going to go home with Jesus when he comes is that we have his robe of righteousness around us, right? In that we may not be exactly perfect, and yet we are perfect in Christ Jesus. You understand what I mean? We're not really fully redeemed yet. We have to have the resurrection from the dead, correct? And those of us who are alive, Paul says, and remain shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We will be fashioned, our bodies will be likened to his glorious body after his resurrection. And then our redemption is complete. We are indeed perfect then. And who does it? Does Norman Bassett do any of it? I do none of it. Do you do any of it? You do nothing. But God does it all for us. Think of that. His robe of righteousness. He only says, come to me, look to me. I will not cast you out. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the world, he says. I will never leave you. And God's appeal to us is, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. Stay connected to me. No matter how hard times get, no matter how the difficult, what difficulties you may face, and let me tell you something, Christians face a lot of difficulties and there are many more difficulties ahead of us. You know, my heart goes out to our young people because of all of the things that are taking place in our world today and what they may have to go through. But God says, lo, Jesus says, I am with you even to the end of the world. I'm never going to leave you. 
I'm always going to be right there with you. You may not always feel my presence, but I tell you, I am there. I am with you. This is faith. This is righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. Entrusting him explicitly. This is justification. He makes us into a new creature, a new individual. This is, as Paul says, this is the power of God. You may have faith in God's power. Do you have faith in his power? Look at the universe. Look what God has created. Look at this world and see what he has created. You know, the, the, the evolutionists and all of the rest, you know, are foolish. They say that Christians who believe in, this, in the creation account given in Genesis are fools. Well, I got news for them. The creator says that they are fools because he has given plenty of evidence, plenty of evidence of his existence in creation. Believe that. And if God has that kind of a power, don't you think that he can do for you what he has promised to do for you? Don't you think he can do that? This is really faith, isn't it? This is faith in the power of our creator, Jesus Christ, who came here and demonstrated to us what God was really like. Don't be afraid of me. Don't be afraid of the Father. We're not out to get you, but we're here to save you. And this, Jesus says, when I am lifted up, the whole universe is going to be drawn to me <laughs> in a way they've never been before. It is the love of God. They have never seen such a display of his love like this. And they know that if it had happened on their world, on their planet, God would have done the same thing for them. He would have done the same thing for them. What a God we serve. The question is, question is, will you put on that robe of righteousness? Will you maintain that robe of righteousness? Will you stay in contact with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he might finish the work that he has begun in you? And that is the question. Will you yield? to the pleadings of the Holy Spirit. Dear people, we're right there on the end. Jesus, I believe, is coming very, very soon.